right. infiltration of stormwater, once you're getting it into the soil system, there is a significant amount of absorption, adsorption, natural treatment of the standard suite of stormwater pollutants. So that's a big talking point that I often have to touch on, even with people familiar with stormwater is any sort of stormwater infiltration, you are getting treatment of that stormwater oh, sure. through, right, right. through the soil right. system. Of course. But, and it's not just getting in there and falling down into the groundwater <laughs> table immediately. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the time, time and gravity are on our side. Exactly. Hey there, welcome to the Stormwater World Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to a new episode of the Stormwater World Podcast. With me today is Alex Bennett from Torrent Resources based in Southern California. And we're going to talk about deep infiltration through dry wells today. Before we get started, a little bit about Alex. Alex works on the sizing and design of dry well systems, as well as educating and removing reg regulatory barriers around dry well implementation. Prior to his tenure at Torrent, he worked as a consultant in municipal stormwater compliance and water quality plan review. Uh, Alex received his master's degree in environmental science with a focus in water resources management from the Bren School at UC Santa Barbara. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for being with us on the podcast. How are you? Hey, no problem. Thank, <laughs> thanks for having me, Ty. Yeah, that's the one shortcoming of my grad program is to get my degree out. It takes about 30 seconds. Oh, no. And it's just my, it's all my fault. I ask everybody, hey, give me your bio. And I get so I get these bios and I'm like, oh my gosh, I got I need to get this in here. Give everybody their props. So like, why are we listening to this guy about deep infiltration? It's because he knows what he's talking about. But, and then, uh, which I obviously don't know what I'm talking about because I, I, as we're, we were talking pre-call, I'm not even familiar with with this process. So why don't you just I always tell everybody just talk to me like I'm a like I'm a five year old and just walk us through just the basics of what is deep infiltration and some of the benefits, pros and cons, and we'll just we'll just roll from there, if that sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I want to start this off by saying you're not alone. Um, <laughs> good, perfect. You know, a lot of folks, <laughs> yeah, even in places where dry wells are used commonly, aren't familiar. Dry wells, we use it synonymously with deep infiltration. Basically, the goal being something that isn't a surface level infiltration system. So if we zoom way, way out, we're talking here really about permanent stormwater BMPs or stormwater control measures. So these are post-construction measures, ways to treat stormwater, meet those um, permit requirements, whether it's MS4 or other new developments. Basically, the what it boils down to is if you're disturbing this much area, you have to treat this much stormwater before it leaves the site, with the goal being you want that drainage pattern to really match what was pre-development before there was anything there. You want it to match that as closely as possible. So if you're putting in a lot of hardscape, they want to see a way to mitigate that. And so really one of the most kind of popular, most often prioritized choices is on-site infiltration or retention and infiltration. So that's basically catching that stormwater in place rather than treating it and then draining it out to your storm drain system or something like that, finding a way to take those flows, keep them on site, infiltrate them back into the soil surface or subsoil. And that way it's essentially as if or as close as we could hope to get, we never put that building in place. So you're still getting the same amount of rainfall during a standard storm event going into the ground, going into the soil, subsoils, eventually making it back down to the groundwater table. And so there's a myriad of different ways to do that. And that's, we can get into that in a little bit of how to look at a site, see what's going to be a good choice, shallow infiltration, deep infiltration, this BMP, that BMP. But with deep infiltration, we basically and dry wells, we're basically taking the same zone of infiltration that you would see with a infiltration trench or a, a surface level basin, taking that, locating it vertically within the soil column. So it's a system that is deep instead of wide. So when you're looking at it from above, very small footprint, uh, dry well typically 
six foot diameter system, you're really only seeing the 30 inch manhole on top. And then it can go down anywhere from 15 feet down to 50, 60, 70 feet, sometimes 100 feet plus in parts of Arizona where Torrent does a, a number of dry well installs. And so the dry well, really the goal is accessing favorable soils at depth. With a very shallow system, it's really dependent on what those surface soils look like. With a dry well, you're looking at the entire soil column down to 50 feet plus. And so there's a, a lot better chance of hitting a sandy patch, getting some lateral infiltration. And you know, ultimately we don't want to connect directly to the groundwater table. That's not <laughs> right. the that's an actual well, right? Like if yeah, I, if, yeah, I'm, not if I'm not mistaken, that, that's an actual well. <laughs> that was, yeah, uh, we, there, uh, there, it says dry in the name for yeah, a reason. Gotcha, so, yeah. and we really we don't want to open up that Pandora's box. When you get into direct contact with the groundwater table, it becomes a different system entirely. And there mm-hmm. there are companies and people dedicated to doing that. And that is above my pay grade out of my wheelhouse. So the goal, yeah. Do you, do you stop once you get to the type of soil you like, or do you go as deep as you possibly can for volume before you get to the water table or is it case, yeah, case by case? That's a good question. It, yeah. It, and it depends on the site and the goals and how much we're trying to treat as well as the, the soils that we're seeing. So if we're seeing rely really heavily, and I think anyone who works in infiltration design relies really heavily on the soils report from the geotechnical engineer. And then I'll put this one up front. This is one of my kind of big takeaways is that if you're on the design side, the geotech is your friend. They're not just someone who's doing slab design and writing a 600 page paper for you to throw away. They're giving you really helpful information for determining your infiltration BMP and what those dimensions are going to look like. So within the soils report, they're often taking boring down to 40 feet or two until they encounter groundwater. And those boring logs and any perk tests that they do, percolation tests that they do throughout the soil column, that's really what's informing the dimensions of the drywall system. So if we look at those boring logs and we see that there's a confining clay layer at 40 feet, we might not go past 40 feet. If we just know it, we're going to be sitting on clay that doesn't infiltrate that well, we're going to target something a little higher. If there's sandier soils from 25 to 30 feet, we'll probably just stop around 30. Mm -hmm. As far as groundwater, we always want at the very least five feet of separation, typically 10 feet of separation from bottom of system to groundwater tables. So since these are designed for infiltration in the Vado zone, we want to make sure that water that gets infiltrated has the appropriate amount of like residence time before it's coming into contact with any groundwater. So yeah, it's it does vary based on what we're seeing out there. The flip side would be, and we see this really commonly in Southern California, especially LA County, you get almost like a crust of really clay silty soils from surface down to 10 or 15 feet deep once you punch past that then you're seeing sandy soils sandy gravelly soils and so that's where dry wells are a really good fit where you're not getting those favorable infiltration rates at surface level to the point where you might not even consider infiltration but if i'm just sitting on clay and i'm trying to get water into the ground it doesn't matter how big your basin is it's just going to sit there but with a dry well since these are bored out Mm -hmm. systems we have the opportunity to come in bore through that get down into the sandy soils below and target that infiltration 30 40 feet so that's where the dry well dimensions come into play it's a factor of how big is your site how much volume do you need to treat which is Mm -hmm. The, the method for calculating that kind of depends on the jurisdiction reviewing agency, but what doesn't change as much is what do the soils look like? Yeah. What is the geotech telling us yeah. about the soils? That's always equally important and that's really going to dictate the, the design of the system. I got you. I got a couple of more questions then on that. So yeah. number, first is you said, did you say VEDA zone? 
not the nerd term i'm not familiar with that could you unpack that for everybody or that maybe so even like the, me yeah, the, <laughs> <laughs> Veto zone is basically what we're talking about when we talk about not the, the shallow soil, surface level soils. It's that kind of mid layer of soils. If you think of, here's your house up, here's groundwater right here. It's everything that lives in between. Okay. And so it's a soil system that really with kind of traditional surface level stormwater infiltration BMPs, it's difficult to access that, particularly if there are any Confine, confining layers higher up in the soil column. I gotcha. And, and, yeah. Oh, and then what would be the minimum? So what would be the minimum depth that makes it effective? And then, or do you at times just make it bigger? So would you make it bigger if you have to go shout? Is that even a thing? Like, how does that yeah. factor in? No, that's a good question. That's really where kind of BMP selection comes into play. So as far as the drywall systems that Torrent installs. And I do want to preface this by saying drywalls in essence are a generic BMP. Anyone can put in a drywall. By definition, a drywall is just a shaft in the ground. You right. could go right. dig the world's worst drywall in the backyard <laughs> yeah. if you wanted to. Yeah. It, um, here, in, here in Texas, it would be about two and a half feet deep. I don't think yeah. it'd be very effective. So. <laughs> world's but, smallest but, and yeah. worst drywall. Yeah, yeah. And so what, what we're installing, we call manufactured drywalls. And basically the, the difference with that is we have a precast settling chamber on top that serves for pretreatment, catches, intercepts the initial flows allows removal of sediment, solids, things like that. And it really protects the zone of infiltration. And so the zone of infiltration is a gravel shaft below the settling chamber. Okay. I mentioned at our deepest depths out in Phoenix area, 100, 110 feet, you would see something like a 15 to 20 foot settling chamber up top with a 90 foot infiltration column below more typical for California is in the realm of 40 to 60 feet in terms of total depth. And so with those depths, we do vary the diameter of the system between four feet and six feet. So it's not a huge variation, but typically with a shallower system, uh, we want to maximize that infiltrating surface area that's available. So we would go with a six foot diameter system. As we go deeper, we don't want to be removing too much soil, like in a six foot diameter column down to 60 plus feet. So that's when we typically switch to a four foot diameter. And then when we're talking about as shallow as we can go really shallow, if the site calls for it about, I would say the most squished down our, our system could get is about 14 feet. Oh, wow. So yeah. And that would be with a short precast settling chamber up top, and then a little, probably six foot or so infiltration column below. Beyond that, and then when we're talking about getting wider, if we're talking really shallow, that's when a infiltration gallery would start to make more sense. So if you have, if, if you're looking at your soils report that you've got great soils from six to 12 feet something like that. And then it gets a little silty below. Maybe there's, maybe you have slightly shallower groundwater, not, not as shallow as Texas, but say, yeah. say groundwater is 25 feet below ground surface, something okay. like that. If you're looking at calcing out how many dry wells you need, you're looking at four or five dry wells. That's where it starts to make sense to basically squish what would be dry wells together and do a single infiltration gallery, either something precast, like a precast vault with an open bottom or a series of arches that are able to store that stormwater and infiltrate it down. And so that's, that's so, where we see the, the value trade off from dry wells to galleries. So I guess the difference then from a traditional chamber unit, what you're saying with that yeah. gallery is that we're still punching, we're still punching through. So we got a little bit better infiltration potentially than, you know, some of these Co just chamber units it. that just hold the water and let it, you know, let time and gravity yeah, do their thing. And... Yeah. And, and then with the kind of the chambers or the gallery, the kind of difference is that you're, you've got more storage available and you're able to go a little bit taller maybe and still be infiltrating. Yeah. At 10 feet. So it's, you're getting more storage in the unit than you would with a surface level basin. 
Yes. And it's also, you have the, the added benefit of it being tucked underneath your parking area. Not everybody has to look at your big stormwater basin where right. with a lot of sites, you know, especially further inland you go, you do have the space to put in a big basin. They say, I'll just put my parking lot over here. But in a lot of the more densely populated areas, you don't have that opportunity to. Oh, you know, I, I don't, I, the parking lot. I don't care how much space they have. I don't think there's any developer that would be like, oh no, <laughs> I really want to give up this acreage and have it do nothing. We'll put a fountain in it and call it, you know, that no, they yeah. would much prefer to be able to have usable space. So I, the footprint thing is definitely a big benefit. But what are some, what would be, what would be some of the other benefits over like other options or other devices or other, like, when would you go for it? When would you not go for it in the places? Obviously places here where I live, you would have to do something different, but when you're in a place and you've got options, what are some of the other benefits other than just the footprint? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And, and that's. I, I love all infiltration being, I was a plane reviewer before this. I've seen them all. I've seen every layout imaginable. Drywells are just my favorite, but I think where drywells uh, do end up making a lot of sense is if there are specific site constraints, either related to adjacent buildings or any of those kind of geotechnical constraints that I mentioned before, but even getting beyond our soils, good or bad. If you're looking at actual like zones of liquefaction that get identified by the soils engineer a lot. So these are liquefaction zones are more susceptible to in, in okay. the case of an earthquake. And so they okay. don't want any soils engineers don't want any sort of infiltration occurring in those zones. You don't want to oversaturate those soils. And so with a dry well system, we actually do a slurry around the top portion of the settling chamber but we can adjust that slurry as deep as needed. So if there's a site where you don't want to infiltrate until 25, 30, even 40 feet below ground surface, soils are good beyond that from 40 to 50 feet, we can do a 15 foot settling chamber slurry right past it and basically slurry all the way down to 40 feet. So zero infiltration is going to occur until that target depth. Oh. And so that also comes into play with stormwater BMPs immediately adjacent to buildings. If you've got a foundation, you've got footings down at four to six feet below ground surface, you don't want to be infiltrating all of your stormwater right next to the footing and having it cause all sorts of complications. So again, we can actually drop that slurry, make sure that infiltration isn't even starting until 15 feet below rim or 15 feet below ground surface. So that's make sure a targeted slurry depth, a deep slurry to stop that infiltration from occurring until we want it to start, which is very helpful with these uh, kind of constrained spaces. The, the other benefit just on the performance side is with a deep system and you think about that column of water anywhere from 20 to 50 feet plus in depth that's operating on that, you've got a lot of head that is on that zone of infiltration. So with the lateral infiltration that occurs, we see really favorable infiltration rates. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a number of post-installation perk tests on our units, and I've seen infiltration rates anywhere from 0.2 to 0.6 CFS per unit, which is about as fast as the hydrant can get water into the drywall system itself. So we do see really favorable rates and it's due to a combination of, you know, hitting these varying soil layers throughout the column and then also having a significant column of water operating upon each of those zones of infiltration. So would you also include like some flood mitigation? How, what's the volume on these things? Are they, is that a, yeah. a benefit or that, is that something to talk about? Yeah, definitely. It's, so that is one of the big trade-offs and that's where we, if we're talking about like a two-year storm, five-year storm, 10-year storm, I always recommend money is better spent and your space is going to be better used with a large detention structure or a basin, but with dry wells as a supplement essentially to help with drawdown. So when you're looking at the storage, just dead storage within a dry well, if you fill it up, it's 
pretty small. It's only about five to 700 cubic feet per dry well. Mm -hmm. So if you're using those for dead storage or just pure flood control, there's not going to be that much of a benefit, at least compared to if you were to put in a, a big vault or a large basin, something like that, that the, your money and space is just going to be better spent for that. But they, the dry wells can draw those basins and draw those vaults down very efficiently in between storm events. And so that's a really common application for us in the Arizona area. And then in the Palm Springs, Indio area as well, where you see a big basin for your hundred year storm event, that's your dead storage with a series of dry wells in the base of it to help with drawdown in between storm events, mitigate any sort of standing water vector control issues, things like that. I got you. So it also looks like I'm looking at you. I'm on the website. I'm trying to educate myself and through you and through the website. <laughs> I'm just kind of taking a, a cram course right now. It, it also looks like, and maybe I'm wrong, but it looks like you got some quality in here too. So some storm water quality. Are you, so are we filtering as well as, are we treating, excuse me, are we treating the water as well while we're infiltrating? Yeah. So the, the lion's share of the treatment occurs through that infiltration. Infiltration of stormwater, once you're getting it into the soil system, there is a significant amount of absorption, adsorption, natural treatment of the standard suite of stormwater pollutants. So that's a talking point that I, I often have to touch on, even with people familiar with stormwater, is any sort of stormwater infiltration you are getting treatment of that storm water oh, sure. through, right, right. through the of soil course. system. Of course. But, and it's not just getting in there and falling down <laughs> the groundwater table immediately. <laughs> exactly. Um, time, time and gravity are on our side. Exactly. I just didn't know if I um, saw uh, some media. Did I see media in here? I don't know. Yeah. So okay. there, we do have two basically supplemental pouches that we put in there okay. that are used for just hydrocarbon removal. Okay. All right. Well, that's uh, cool. Basically. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's, I would consider it incidental. I wouldn't design, use one of these systems to treat a gas station or something like <laughs> right. that. Or, right. Yeah. But uh, I mean, if without, you've got the, you've got the vault, yeah. you've got the structure, so might as well. Um, which, yeah. Which and, leads and into and the so, next question. Cause anytime you've yeah. got that, even with just, you know, infiltration, like a detention pond, like I don't consider, you know, a detention pond, obviously it is water quality I'm saying like putting the additional yeah. medias and things in there to assist so what does maintenance look like on these things? That's the ugly word in our, in our industry. So you want to talk about maintenance? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I have a, a pretty answer to that ugly word and oh, good, it's, good. That it's easy. Yep. Yeah. And, and so with that precast settling chamber up top, and you can probably see when you're looking at the systems, we have the Maxwell four, which is just the standalone drywall single shaft. And then the Maxwell plus, which basically takes the downstream Maxwell four adds on an additional upstream settling chamber. Um, that this, so okay, so is, that's what yeah, I'm looking at two, right now. Two okay. settling chambers, All yeah. Right. Okay. And so that's that. just an, an additional pretreatment opportunity. Generally recommend that for right-of-way applications, really large tributary areas, anything where you're seeing a lot of sediment loading, but they're both maintained the same way, which is just through that 30-inch manhole cover at the top. Basically, any site representative can do the regularly scheduled inspection. You just look in there, see if there's any obstructions, measure to the bottom of the chamber with a tape measure and a plumb bob. Once that chamber loses 10 to 20% of capacity, foot and a half to three feet of sediment buildup, we recommend service, and that's just done via standard vac truck. Oh. So they come in, remove all the sediment, double check those screens that everything's still in place, replace those hydrocarbon pouches and the system's good to go. Perfect. So it's, yeah, it's really easy. And it's one of my favorite parts that there isn't a whole lot of proprietary media to replace a whole lot of headache associated with it. And it also, like I mentioned earlier, protects the zone of infiltration. That infiltration shaft below really is cordoned off from any sort of pretreatment that's occurring up above which helps with the longevity of the system with long-term performance of the dry wells. Oh yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Cause it, oh yeah. I'm looking at that. So cause it, that other pipe. Okay. Yep. I think that makes sense. All right. So what about cost the effectiveness or how do you compare it, contrast it? If everything is equal and I can go vertical or horizontal other than the footprint thing, like how does it, 
how do you sell it to me? Right? Like, how, how do you say, especially if people aren't aware, which we can talk about that there in a second, especially from the regulatory side, maybe, but from a cost side, is there, do you have to show some additional benefits? Is it pretty equal if you have the opportunity? Yeah, that's a good question. And it, a lot of it comes down to what the soils we're seeing on site are and what those infiltration rates look like. If we have good infiltration rates throughout the soil column, and we're able to treat that volume with one or two dry wells. I think nine times out of 10 dry wells are more cost effective, but if there are, if the rates at depth aren't as favorable or there is a significant amount of space available, that's when we start to see shallow systems making more sense. Or if it's the other one where I, I almost push against dry wells is really small sites, uh, single family homes, things like that. Uh, these dry wells are really robust systems. We certainly can size them for a small site, but oftentimes if we're talking about a single family residence where you're just getting foot traffic, you're just, it just happens to be big enough that the, the city says you have to do stormwater treatment. <laughs> you're better off doing kind of a, a natural system or permeable pavers or something like that. Um, it, comparing costs, it is a little bit different. We are kind of apples to oranges because torrent resources does operate as a subcontractor. So okay. we are doing the installs for all of these dry well systems. We have all of our own drill rigs. Every cost estimate that we provide is for the unit in the ground, including all materials, excavation, delivery of the system. So sometimes that aspect does get a little tricky where with some of the other BMPs, it's just delivered on site, you drop guys, the box, right. leave it to the utility sub to install. But that's a lot of folks really end up enjoying the fact that we're coming in and yeah. installing the dry wells. Like our typical installs take, you know, two to three days roughly. So we're in and out pretty quick out of everybody's hair, we typically mobilize during rough grade um, before all the other utilities go in. So once we install, all you have is two manholes to walk around. Work around, yep. That's yeah. the I like, turn. like that, the lack of yeah. excavation and things like that. I like turnkey. Nothing against all the great contractors out there, but I've seen some, of course, I've yeah. seen pictures and I've heard the horror stories of like improperly installed things. <laughs> we just leave it at that. So if you guys are just installing your own thing, then I, I kind of, I like that. Did you want to talk about any kind of the regulatory issues or getting these things approved? I guess they're approved in some places and not in others as everybody else is yeah. always fighting the good fight, but what's the thoughts Definitely. on that? So, so like you, even people pretty well ingrained in the stormwater <laughs> community aren't super familiar with dry wells, even in California, even in the Pacific Northwest. My, my colleagues and I joke that if we could, if we had a time machine, the first thing we would do is go back in time and rename these from dry wells to vertical infiltration BMPs and just get the well out. <laughs> get the name. well out. Yeah. Get the exactly, well out. Yeah. Because yeah. that, that really isn't the goal. It's what they look like. Yeah. They look like a lid is dry, but the goal is not any sort of interface with the groundwater table, either for withdrawing or putting flows in. These are just a stormwater treatment BMP. So we've been working at the state level in California. We had a, some success a couple of years ago that dry wells have been removed from the state well construction standards, which are, as you guessed it, designed for water supply wells, aquifer recharge wells, things like that. And then in the past, we had this infiltration BMP just sitting in there subject to the same standards, which includes casing all the way down and things that just don't work for stormwater infiltration. So the, the next step is going to be statewide guidance on how to size these dry wells. And I think that'll be really helpful. There's strong guidance in the Southern portion of the state, just because they've, you know, seen a lot of dry wells make sense there. It's a little more nebulous in the northern portion of the state right now. And then also going up through Idaho, Utah, there just, there isn't a barrier per se. There's no prohibition on dry wells, but mm -hmm. there's no clear path for permitting and approval as a stormwater BMP. And so that's a, the big hurdle is just making those connections, helping people understand 
what the purpose of these, why they are the depths that they, you know, a lot of the same conversation we're having today is why they look like they do. Why, why wouldn't I just go with what I've always done, which is surface level basins or permeable pavers, things like that. And so that's the, the big push for the next couple of years is a combination of education, outreach, and then really sitting down with some of these decision makers and looking at that regulatory framework around permitting of dry wells as infiltration BMPs. Do you guys ever do any combos with permeable? I, th I think some permeable paving solutions in combination with this would work pretty well. We do combos on just about every other BMP you could think of. That That's another nice thing about dry wells is they, because of the small footprint, they can fit into a site and fit into a stormwater treatment train really easily. Mm -hmm. So a, a very common layout that we see throughout California is pre-treatment BMP, a vortex separator, mm -hmm. baffle box, something like that, right. leading into a big detention tank leading into a one to three dry wells. And that's a really common layout. And then we can, our part of Old Castle infrastructure and part of uh, CRH Americas, we can, we can work with any sort of BMP upstream, but we are able to do some internal collaboration if needed. If an engineer wants a one-stop shop on saying, you know, yeah. <laughs> I've got this site, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I need pre-treatment detention infiltration. I need it all. We can do those internal collaborations if needed, or if on the other hand, if an engineer says, Hey, I, I always use this for pretreatment. I always, or the city's requiring me to use this specific BMP for pretreatment, right. but I, I don't know how to infiltrate it. We can also definitely do that. So that's, we've done a combination of shallow and deep infiltrations on a lot of sites, which does work great to your point, walkways, things like that. You do permeable pavers get some of that shallow infiltration and then out in your parking area or somewhere you've got a larger tributary area, you can do a couple of dry wells as well. Okay. And then as you look at different jurisdictions too, you do see different requirements in terms of pretreatment. Orange County, for example, Orange County, California, very robust. They have a, a strong uh, water recycling program there. They are doing groundwater recharge. And part of that is a very involved review of any proposed infiltration BMPs and making sure that there is pretreatment beyond sediment removal. So they want cartridge media filters or proprietary biotreatment upstream of any infiltration that occurs. So that's a, that's another common treatment train that we see as well something really robust upstream draining down into the dry well which is fine by us. I think our system is really robust on its own, but I'll always welcome more pre-treatment upstream. It can't hurt right. uh, other than the pocketbooks. Yeah. That developers, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's another conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, but <laughs> you're right. Hey, I'm going to get off your website now, but I do have one more question. If you want to touch sure. on it, I, I see that you guys have a design tool for folks that need some assistance. So if you want to talk about that. Yeah, um, absolutely. We do have a design tool. We have a kind of team of technical marketing engineers. I'm one. I have uh, several colleagues spread throughout the state. We're all always on hand to answer any questions, run sizing, take a look at soils reports, see if dry wells would be a good fit. The other thing that we do is since we're a subcontractor, every install that we complete, we take a boring log um, of the soils that we encountered. If there was anything unforeseen, we'll make a note of it, large cobbles, boulders, things like that, clay patches. And so the team of technical marketing engineers, if you have a question, it's just, Hey, I've got a dry well in this city. Do you have any nearby installs? We can look at our installs, say, yes, we do. And we actually found good soils starting at 25 feet below ground surface. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. And so we're always on hand for that. We can put together details, refine details as needed, but. As far as just getting an idea of unit counts, seeing if you'd need one dry well or 20 dry wells. Well, yeah, we do have a, a great online tool. You basically just put in your desired volume. So whatever the, the mitigated volume required by the reviewing agency is the design infiltration rate and the depth of groundwater. Those are the, the three big things just to get a super high level idea of 
number of drywalls needed. Okay. From there, someone on our team will take a look at it, get in contact with you, see if you want to take a closer look at the soils, uh, refine those numbers a little bit. But yeah, as far as getting a quick unit count, the online sizing tool is a really great resource. I got you. As we wrap up, what's the best way for people to reach out to you, Alex, if they want to follow up and get some more information from you? Definitely, definitely. So yeah, the, the online sizing tools at torrentresources.com, but I'm available via email, LinkedIn, okay. uh, either the offices are Bloomington, California office or the Phoenix office. We have uh, technical marketing engineers in both. And so somebody will get in contact with you depending on where your project's located. And uh, yeah, I'm always happy to jump on a call with whoever, answer any questions, talk about dry wells. <laughs> I can go a lot longer than this. This could be a four hour podcast. <laughs> yeah, like, I, no, I, I, I learned a lot just in those, the brief amount of time we're, we're together. I appreciate you taking the time to to come on the podcast, I think, I think everybody would at least, right? Like you don't know what you don't know. And so at least that you can go, what is it? Vert you can go vertical instead of horizontal. And so that it's really interesting. I'll probably stare at your website some more later, but all this stuff, all, we'll put Alex's, all his contact information, like we always do in, in the show notes. And uh, before we go, any final thoughts, anything you would like to leave everybody? Anything we missed about deep infiltration? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think just those big takeaways that I had is on, on the design side, be sure you're working with the geotech, be sure you're aware that they're a resource for you, that they can really unlock some of the mysteries of your site in terms of whether infiltration will work. And then, uh, yeah, just take a look at each site. There's no one size fits all approach for infiltration or for stormwater treatment, really examining what's going to be the best fit for that site. And, uh, oftentimes, uh, drywalls are a good choice, but certainly they're not the, the best choice every time. And just really understanding what goes into BMP selection can really help with efficient stormwater control for a site in the long term. Have you guys ever seen any failures? Like, I know we're probably we're wrapping up and I'm opening up another can of worms. Have you guys seen any failures or is there anything that people should... Obviously, the geotech is huge, right? If you're not paying attention to that, you're just asking to fail. But have you seen anything that you just throw out there, hey, whatever you don't do this, or have you guys ever experienced anything crazy? You looked at the geotech, it seemed fine, you get to going, and then why is this thing not working? That's a good question. The most, you know, the closest thing I would say that we regularly see to a failure is variations in that shaft that we're drilling down. Even with the best and most robust soils information, Sometimes there's weird sandy pockets that sure. you didn't expect out in the field. Right. Since we are act acting as the subcontractor, we're aware of that. We're taking a look. We know whenever we experience belling out or caving during an install, but it is something that does happen, uh, especially as you get more coastal in some of these loose sands. Uh, and so we do have a number of practices in place for how best to deal with caving or belling out. One option is basically a slurry plug where we would preemptively pour some slurry in there, hold that upper portion of the shaft together, punch through that to get a little bit of extra depth. Others are stopping at the depth where caving or belling occurs and then running a post-installation perk test just to verify that the real world drywall performance matches or exceeds what we calculated during the kind of design phase. And the, the good news of that is when you're experiencing belling out or caving, that means that these soils are so sandy. That's where we see those really high infiltrations. Uh, yeah, it's a good, it's a um, double-edged so, sword. Know, yeah. Exactly, gotcha. exactly. So yeah, that's the most common, not failure per se, but field modification that we do need to make during those installs is... Ultimately, there is a little bit of unpredictability with soil. Well, yeah, yeah. Where, uh, I Maybe mean, I shouldn't have used the word failure. Stuff. I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. No, uh, no. I, I think there's things to be learned out in the field. Absolutely. When, when, so I think it's, again, we'll just go back to the fact that turnkey, turnkey contract, the fact that you guys are willing to put in your own device. And so you're on you know, on the hook to from until it's in the, until it's in the ground. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. From concept through execution, we're, we're always on hand. So. I, I like to stay involved with 
on most of my projects, even even if the guys doing the install don't want to see me out in the field. Yeah, I was like, oh them. no, they, Alex is the here. <laughs> Alex is here. We don't need you, Alex. You're like, no, just come to look, man. <laughs> yeah, we go yeah, to exactly. we, we look, I, keep my distance. Oh my gosh, we go to try to just take pictures and stuff for our agency on projects, and it's, we're not coming to tell you what to do. We just want to take some pictures. <laughs> we're not OSHA. We're just coming to hang out, take some pictures for social media. Everybody relax. Exactly. No, that's awesome. It was, it was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, thanks again for having me. This was really fun. And yeah, like I said at the beginning, I'm a big fan of the podcast. So oh, thank you. It was a treat to get to come on here. Now you have to listen to yourself. You're like, so people don't realize I don't like, I don't even listen to the episodes. Spoiler alert. Like I, I struggle listening to my own voice. We had a post production team. They do some of this stuff. And then my wife, she does the show notes and she listens to it. She loves the podcast, but she's, she's my number one fan. But man, I struggle <laughs> going back. And then when I have to hear my own voice, I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you all so much for listening to this podcast. <laughs> Alex, it's been a pleasure. Please appreciate it. Thanks again, Ty. I really appreciate it.